Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today at, at Filmscape Chicago. Uh, my name is Carl Cook. I'm the Vice President of Film and Television here at PRG. Um, and uh, I'll be hosting the panel today, uh, Solutions for the New Production Landscape. And so we have, we have some very talented people with us uh, from PRG that uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce. Uh, first up, we have Yaron Hallert. He's Vice President of Production Services at PRG. And uh, he oversees our film and television off offerings within uh, uh, the virtual production realm, uh, him and his team. So he's one of, the, uh, one of the smart guys behind the scene. Uh, we also have Scott Dale, uh, PRG Director of Cinema and Imaging Solutions. And Scott was very helpful uh, in uh, uh, developing uh, the cinema department over the last six or seven years um, in the camera division. And uh, one note I want to make uh, mention for everyone on the on the call: um, you you will see in some material there'll be uh, VER logos. But just for those of you who aren't aware, uh, PRG and VER uh, recently merged, and so both companies are synonymous. So uh, some folks still uh, refer to us or know to us as VER, uh, but it is PRG, and so I just don't want to make sure anybody's any confusion um, on that. And so just a little more about Scott. Um, Scott's been, as I said, very instrumental in uh, designing um, our production uh, values and, and the prep uh, uh, facilities throughout our six or seven camera offices. And he's also been increasingly involved in uh, LED and immersive technologies. And so uh, through both of that, he's, he's 30 years of, of production and innovation, and um, we're very lucky to have him. And both of these gentlemen are, are going to speak a little more I'll let the smart guys do as much talking as possible. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our account executive in our Chicago office, uh, Logan Cavelli. Uh, Logan uh, is graduated from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, before moving to Los Angeles, where he spent uh, lots of time um, in production in the field. And he worked with directors, uh, with the director, Paul Thomas Anderson. And since he's moved back home, uh, getting back to his roots, um, He's now working out of our, our Chicago office, our new cinema space. And Logan's gonna tell you a little bit about that uh, later on, our location, uh, the services, and uh, a little bit about the space. And so what we, intend, what we hope to do here today, guys, is, is uh, the panel is gonna discuss production uh, innovations and workflows um, that can be implemented in today's new production landscape. And um, we'll talk about our locations and how that affects costs and how that's relevant to uh, workflow. Uh, again, all of this post-COVID, but a lot of this technology has been um, evolving. And so what's happened since uh, the pandemic, it's really just accelerated um, this type of work. And so we're also going to talk, uh, which is very important, is the COVID guidelines that we have. We have some pr very stringent uh, safety procedures that we're going to outline for you folks to make sure that all of our customers and partners um, are safe and healthy. And lastly, um, if we're going to have, uh, we're going to try and leave 15 minutes here at the end for Q&A. So if everyone would just reserve the questions until then, and uh, we'll have a bit of an open uh, forum at the last 15 minutes. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to share um, one of our extended reality shoots, what we call XR, uh, our stage um, in Los Angeles. Um, and this is from a client Massimo uh, with director Mark Henson. And we put this video together uh, just to, to, as a marketing material for, for our customers. And uh, Aaron, if we could take a look at that, um, go ahead and roll whenever you're ready. So we're here at PRG, day one. We're doing commercial for Mossimo and we're using uh, LED walls with 3D virtual elements. So what we're doing here is we're using a, a technique, an LED wall, which tracks to the camera and we can move the set around us in real time and change sets and change backgrounds. So we have the math of this that should add up to the math of that, but it might not. <laughs> so you have some flexibility, but once we put that wall up, we have none. This is one of the first times that we're using these many props yeah. in this kind of setup too. Once she gets up, you'll be seeing a couple of these things move. By the time she's here, she's probably in the new environment. 
just um, in communication with Mark, who's on stage, and he's directing. I'm just queuing up the music, which the whole commercial is going to be timed to. Okay, that was great. Seriously, that was great. There are those we count on to support us, no matter what. Is everything okay, Doctor? Yes, yes. Whether we see them or not, we need to know that they're always there. Can't go home. For the past 25 years, Massimo has been monitoring patients in hospitals around the world so that time. doctors and nurses can make sure you feel safe. As new challenges have arisen, we've grown to bring that same safety and support to the place that you want to be most. If we've learned nothing else, it's that when challenges arise, there's only one way to rise above. Together. Massimo. Together in hospital. Together at home. Okay, great. Thank you, Aaron. All right, so now uh, we're gonna, I'll, I'll address the panel here and, and to the panel. Uh, let's get the audience up to speed on, on what we're witnessing um, in our work environments, uh, talk about some of the productions that we're hosting and also um, some of the, get the safety guidelines uh, that we're implementing. And with that, we'll start with Yaron on, on the West Coast um, with PRG's Production Studio Services in Los Angeles. Um, you don't, can you tell us a little bit about that commercial that we just saw, the Massimo commercial, and uh, some of the technology that was deployed on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Carl. Um, so the, um, the commercial we all just witnessed, uh, funnily enough, was not only a commercial for um, a shot on the, uh, on the XR stage under COVID measures, but the actual company also uh, makes and provides uh, people in the medical world with uh, all different kind of tools uh, in the um, uh, in dealing with the whole uh, um, pandemic and, and, and sickness. But going back to the actual uh, technology of the shoot, and uh, today I'm uh, part of the team that's supporting another shoot uh, on the same stage. That's why I'm wearing this little uh, bracelet. Um, everybody coming in this morning had to have a, a test on site, giving you the results within 20 minutes. And that enables uh, productions uh, on our stage to, first of all, to do the production, of, of course. Uh, but also we have set up, and all of what we're talking about today, you can find back on our uh, website and, and, and social media and in, 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 in documents and in, in videos. But uh, doing um, uh, productions under, under COVID measures really made us rethink the whole production process. Um, Pre-corona, virtual production was starting to, pl to play a uh, significant role, but Corona uh, slash COVID really pushed it out hard the door and made us rethink uh, how we do productions in terms of uh, working together, how many people you put together in a space, in a room, uh, social distancing between workstations, all of these things we had to rethink and implement in, uh, in, in our studio and, and that made it possible quite early on. We have been doing uh, shoots and productions since uh, late May, early June uh, in, in our own spaces, uh, which we completely redesigned in order to do it. So it's been exciting. It's been uh, uh, stressful at, at, at some at some point because you you not only your own teams but also your visiting teams your visiting productions have to uh, follow a specific set of rules um, but all in all I can only say that uh, even with the production we have today uh, it's been going very very smooth that's great you don't and if you could just just for the for the audience can you just uh, take a few minutes and describe some of the technological elements um, that our viewers saw in that clip Sure, sure. We'll talk about it more in detail a little bit later on. But what you saw on the uh, on the clip just now is uh, uh, a relatively small uh, LED setup. So we have an LED floor with two LED walls, uh, quite high res. The walls are a two millimeter pitch. The floor is a four millimeter pitch. Um, we also have camera tracking in the room. We track the camera into the space. Um, so on top of the camera, there's a little system mount that talks with reflectors in the sky. 
and through triangulation, uh, we know exactly where the camera is in space. We combine that plus the uh, lens information, which we're reading in real time, add, that, add to that the actual lens profile. That all goes into the media server. And in the media server, we bring also the 3D environment that was created for this shoot. And for this specific shoot, it was uh, uh, done with Unreal. So bringing the two together through the media server disguise makes it able to have the camera float around in that space and have the backgrounds react in real time to it. So that means that there is very little post to do because as we say on the XR stage, we don't fix it in post, we plan it in pre-production. So before a production comes on set, that whole environment is created. Everything is there all the way from lighting to uh, the, the scaling of the actual set, combining it sometimes with real set pieces. So once production comes on set, within a three day time period, we can shoot a commercial like this uh, in real time and have, have, have the DP and the, and the filmmakers control over almost everything in real time on the set. It's really great. Excellent. Okay, so we're, we're going to touch obviously more on that and we'll bring Scott into the discussion. Um, in the meantime, let's quickly go to, to Logan. Logan's in, in Chicago. Uh, Logan, can you tell us uh, about some of the projects that we're working on in that market and a little bit about the new facility? Uh, yeah, so PRG Camera Chicago is a new facility. It's located inside Cine City which is a newly renovated 10,000 square foot filmmaker campus and hotel that's right next to Cine Space on Southwestern Avenue. Um, we have six, we have over six prep bays, uh, state-of-the-art lens projection room, machine shop, and lots of ample production space to cater to the recent booming industry here in Chicago. Um, right now, we've just begun prep on the NBC Dick Wolf Chicago One series. Uh, Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, and Chicago PD. And also this week, we had a five camera special that will air sometime during Fashion Week. But uh, this it's pretty exciting to be here in Chicago right now because it's, it's quite a change of, of pace for the city in that we have a, a now a dedicated campus that's specifically designed for cinematographers, filmmakers, and directors of photography to take advantage of well, it's now one of the largest global inventories of cinema style cameras and lenses on the market. And then, you know, just being 10 miles away from our 95,000 square foot depot, that really brings it all full circle where we can truly provide a 360 degree uh, full production package, which can include lighting, enhanced environments, installations, and uh, broadcast sy systems engineering. Um, yeah, it's uh, you. You guys got to come check it out. It's pretty. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is very impressive. Uh, I've been there a few times, and of course, uh, we would have had an open house by now. But the world as it is. Uh, so as soon as uh, uh, the world rightens itself, we will uh, uh, be having hosting an open house. But uh, Logan, thank you very much. And can can before we go, can you tell us um, and tell the audience a little bit about the, the safety guidelines and protocols we have for that office? Yeah, um, our approach complies with governmental guidance and administrative controls pretty much uh, across North America. We do everything um, to ensure the safety of everyone that comes into our buildings or any of our work sites. Um, all, all of our North American facilities adhere to these strict guidelines and, and rules depending on local red regulations. But um, for instance, if you come into any of our locations, we'll do a temperature screening and provide a wellness dec declaration as well as those wristbands that you saw your own wearing that indicates compliance for everyone uh, coming into this facility. Um, in Chicago and many of the other locations, we use our smart scan thermal scanner, which is a standalone unit that uh, we also rent out to productions and venues. And these things are capable of, of screening up to 700 people per hour. And all that uh, data is, is completely anonymous. So, um, 
all employees and visitors are required to wear approved face coverings at all times within a PRG facility or any of the premises. Uh, we have sanitizing stations with extra PPE located in the entrances and common areas and near time clocks and kitchens and bathrooms. Um, and really we just use common sense coordination in order to reinforce social distancing. And we have clearly marked work zone capacity areas and other visual reminders to help people avoid in-person gatherings and you know stagger lunch or break times and maintain appropriate capacity you know, while controlling all the entrances and exits and, and neutral zones and um if if anybody uh we, we document everybody that comes into the facility and should anybody be exposed to COVID-19 or start experiencing system, uh, symptoms at our site, we've outlined the appropriate response, including a, a quarantine, full contact tracing, and notifications of any others who may have been in contact with that person who tested positive. Um, so it's pretty, it's it's pretty thorough. But all that information is available on our on our website, which we encourage you to go look at. That's great, Logan, thanks. And I'll open this up also to Scott quickly. Uh, so cameras are exceptionally high touch uh, uh, items in all of the accoutrements and, and Zoom focus and eyepieces. And so could, could you discuss a little bit about our sanitation procedures uh, for that? And Scott, feel free to add um, anything from your side in Los Angeles as well. But I'll, Logan, you can start. Yeah. Um... We've, we've basically standardized the enhanced uh, equipment and facility cleaning measures as part of our QC process. Um, each, each facility has a assigned safety and compliance officer to ensure that all these protocols are met and their updates are continuously met. Um, I don't know if, if Scott can add anything on that, but... Uh, we've been... Um I'm going to say that we've probably sent out seven or 800 cameras in the last couple of months. Everything stopped all at once, of course, and all the gear returned or most of it. And then slowly we've been, um, we've been picking up steam, um, in a, especially in our LA office, which is where I'm located right now. Um, most of the shows have been unscripted shows for, for television. Um, movies and scripted shows are just now starting to come back. NCIS LA, is one of the shows that we do camera on and they prepped last week, they start shooting on Tuesday. NCIS New Orleans, out of our New Orleans office, they're, um, they were supposed to start prep this week, but because of the hurricanes, they got pushed forward a couple weeks. And then in Chicago, um, we've got the Dick Wolf show, Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med. They're all coming back um, in the next two to four weeks as well. Excellent, thank you guys. And hey, Scott, since we have you, um, Real-time visualization obviously is is a tremendous selling point uh, for XR, uh, but we do have other uh, service offerings for our customers. Um, one of those being NCAM. Uh, so, Scott, could you briefly describe uh, what what the NCAM uh, technology is and uh, in what scenarios you might recommend that to a production? Sure. We we actually had an NCAM set up at at Filmscape last year um, on the on the show floor, uh, but what NCAM is a real-time um, tracking cam solution for camera, um, just like Stipe that um, Jeroen mentioned a bit ago. Stipe uses reflectors. Um, NCAM actually looks for contrast points in front of the camera. It's a hardware and software solution together, um, such that you can you can um, onset look at previs at um, CG created characters or dragons or, or monsters or set extensions as well. And um, with NCAM though, it's primarily been green screen. We're just working on trying to incorporate it into a Mandalorian type set with LED as well. Um, but most of the shows that we've done NCAM with have been larger um, TV movies or, or, or television shows, Game of Thrones, Man in High Castle, or big features like Thor Ragnarok and Aquaman and Midway. On Midway, we did set extensions on the uh, battleship. 
and the, and the aircraft carriers. Great, Scott. And I'll open this up to, to the panel here. Our next question. Uh, what other solutions can be implemented to achieve cinema quality content uh, with uh, reduced location availability, work zone requirements, and smaller crews? I would, I would say that, um, you know, what, what we're seeing in Chicago is a lot of streaming, live streaming packages going out um, where a lot of these people are doing interviews and, and panels just like this uh, virtually. And we've kind of dialed in a solution to basically ship each party their own uh, cinema quality live streaming package. And it's, uh, it's all plug and play kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I would, I would note is that uh, as things start to get a little bit more compartmentalized, we are seeing that each, each department within a production is basically getting their own video village package. So we're putting a lot more wireless, uh, wireless units and kits in, in different uh, productions. And I would say that the, the biggest change so far is the, the remote viewing um, that we're seeing. So a lot of people are, are directing, you know, you're, you can live stream your content to the producers in, in New York or across the country and um, basically keep everybody distance, but all viewing the same image in real time. Thanks, Logan. You're on? Yeah, it's the, the film business, whether it's scripted TV, feature film or, or TV, always been powered by the capabilities of, of current available technologies about the invention of the color television or the progress of cinema related technology to special effects capabilities the, ad the adoption of new technology is clearly impacting the way we produce and consume movies and other video related uh, entertainment products a, a few years from now uh, extended reality powered experiences will, will become accessible for large mainstream uh, markets um, I, I would suggest we have a look at, at the last few years of uh, enhanced environments with the combined companies VR and PRG and, and how this process really has evolved under, under, under COVID restrictions. I brought it up earlier, but, but COVID and, and making us work remotely and do work remotely and plan uh, production processes different, uh, that's going to really drive uh, future virtual uh, production. So we put together a, a, a presentation explaining a little bit more into detail what uh, enhanced, what we understand under enhanced environments. And that there's, there's three main categories under en enhanced environments. First one is, is the car process. Uh, some people call it overdrive, uh, but it's basically replacing a green screen environment surrounding a car or any vehicle. It could be a train, it could be a uh, stagecoach, it could be in a, a spaceship, whatever. Um, Scott's touched base on NCAM, that's also something we consider uh, being an enhanced environment. And then a little bit of what we brought up with the uh, commercial in the beginning on the XR stage is really the, uh, the, the pinnacle of what uh, enhanced environment is. But to explain a little bit better, we, we're going to go in depth into the three main uh, pillars of enhanced environment, which is basically uh, LED on one side, uh, right in the middle sits media servers, and then obviously camera as well. So our work really consists of uh, groundbreaking productions across the globe in every form of media and at every scale. Um, we do have a very strong presence, not only in TV film, but with the product specialists in other markets, which we can tap into, uh, it really enables us to, uh, uh, to be on the forefront of, of innovation in this world. Um, we, this shows our, uh, our global footprint. Um, in we have currently close to 70 offices around the world. As, as a combined entity, we're now even larger and more diverse company involved in many areas of, of entertainment with great depth and breadth of inventory across, across the, the whole globe. And um, we have experts on our team in almost every aspect of our industry. So 
this is a this is showing a little bit the uh, the the umbrella under and what everything falls under under enhanced environments and and it's all the way down from uh, again don't fix it in post the planet in pre-production from your development the breakdown of your scripts and then adding in uh, media servers gaming engines such like unity unreal uh, but even a graphic engine just like uh, like notch combining it with cameras rigging lighting actual vfx uh, and we do everything in, in, in real time. We really want to have and hand over the, the handles and the controls to the filmmakers on, on set. So this shows uh, schematically how a enhanced environment typically looks like. And, and depending on the complexity, it all comes down to this. You have your content, the background plates, being played through a media player in which we can have corrections from color correction to speed to uh, intensity all those corrections can be done again on set in, in real time and we have the camera who is synced up with the media player and again we can do some correction in what's happening once the uh, uh, once we have uh, on camera what's happening uh, very important to notice is that on the lighting we can use both classic uh, set lighting, but also actual LED panels for lighting in where we pipe pieces of the content on the background plate into the lighting panel. And that means that now not only your background is, uh, is looking very real, but also the lighting and light effects that can happen in that background are now piped through lighting as well, giving very nice uh, env environmental effects. So let's touch base a little bit more in detail about the LED size. And as you can see, uh, after this presentation, I'm wearing a 10 millimeter pitch shirt today, which means when we're talking about LED, we're talking about uh, pixel pitch. And um, what is pixel pitch? Pixel pitch is the distance between two individual pixels on that uh, LED screen. So heart to heart uh, distance between the RGB, red, green, blue uh, LED, which is actually, the actual LED is, is in fact a small uh, diode consisting of three uh, LEDs, the three colors. Distance between is a pixel pitch. And then there's also something very important to notice in um, shooting uh, in front of an LED screen, especially when you have it in camera, is that there needs to be a uh, blackness, not only a blackness within the pixel, but also a blackness surrounding the pixel. Because we need, the camera needs to find uh, contrast. Um, so that means everybody is now chasing for that higher, higher resolution and that smaller, smaller pixel pitch. But in fact, what we found out is that there is an ideal, uh, at, at least currently, there is an ideal pixel pitch to be found between two and four millimeters. Everything below two millimeters will mean that there is not enough blackness in anymore surrounding that uh, little pixel. Um, something else we need to uh, uh, take into account when we're shooting um, uh, LED on camera is something that Scott's gonna touch base a little bit more, and that is a, uh, an effect not everybody wants, uh, an effect called moire. Yeah, no, that's not something that you want. That's something that we're, we're trying to avoid all the time. And, um, you know, of course, our industry has been doing rear screen or front screen projection for many years. And it wasn't really until the last eight years or seven years or so that an LED panel, that the pixel pitch was tight enough that you don't see more on it. But of course, what makes the whole trick work is that it's slightly out of focus. There are times when you can focus on the screen, um, but uh, more is what we don't want to see. And actually, I think I've got a slide here. So what you see on the right side of the screen is more. And I, I know m most of you probably know what it is, but it's, it's an unwanted side effect that can be corrected by changing the focal length of the camera or the aperture. In this slide, the reason that there's more there is because it's a lower resolution panel, but in this particular setup, we were only using it for lighting. Camera was not gonna be looking at it. And we did see it though, of course, with my, my smartphone when I took the picture of it. 
So with LED walls, once we go on to sets, we can uh, configure and build them in different ways. Um, all the way to the massive example that Disney used with Mandalorian in where they speak actually of an LED volume consisting of over 2000 LED tiles, which are curved around a set. And that's a combination of uh, both hanging and stacking as we call it. So building it from the ground up like little, little Lego blocks. Um, or actually hanging it completely from the ceiling. Obviously, some studios will, uh, will, won't be able to, to hang an even smaller uh, LED screens. So that, that pushes us towards building it from the ground up. But also LED screens can be curved. We don't curve within the panel. That's actually not beneficial for the, uh, for the camera. Uh, but we, we curve uh, with segments. So every um, uh, individual LED panel will form a segment on that uh, curve or bend. So let's um, talk a little bit about the other essential part of enhanced environments, and that's camera, because everything revolves around the camera, of course. Um, everything that you're trying to do revolves around the lens and the camera. Um, we, as a company, um, we have camera off, we have cinema camera prep facilities in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Miami, New Orleans, um, and New York, um, and did I say Atlanta? We have six six of them, and um, we keep them all very busy. We 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 move our equipment around all the time, so um, the depth and breadth of our inventory is humongous. Um, this is a picture of our LA um, prep facility. Um, so professionals who take advantage of our camera prep facilities have access to all of this inventory and and uh, talent. And um, from thoughtful design to in-house expert technicians and engineers, the six prep facilities were created to meet the needs of our community, our production community. And then Ron? we got the final, uh, the final ingredient in the uh, enhanced environment cake, which is an equally important to the previous two. Uh, and that's really the media service. And depending on, uh, on the complexity of the scene, the setup, uh, those media servers are being uh, picked uh, regardless of brand. There's, there's many different brands uh, that are currently available, but you need to spec your media server really in function of the shoot you're actually doing. And the media server will allow you to do uh, partly the, 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 the previous work even uh, before going on, on set, all the way to uh, uh, controlling the, um, uh, the content on, on set. So different media servers, different setups. And that brings us to, to, to planning the actual uh, shoot. So we, we use uh, CAT software to develop the, the setup before we actually start building it. And uh, using uh, CAT software, using 3D models of, uh, of the set. In this case, this was a helicopter shoot where we had to wrap uh, the helicopter partly with LED screens. So, um, that, that will help us massively defining camera angles that uh, either are predefined through the breakdown of the script, or we can actually advise the DP on, on camera angles that can be achieved with the LED surrounding a, a certain uh, set piece. And, and we, we can also, uh, before going on set, we can also uh, uh, try to recreate uh, the reflections that are potentially uh, being had on, on set. And that brings us uh, very nicely into a, a little video clip, which um, Scott will share with us. And this was shot last year at uh, uh, Cinegear uh, and NAB, where we had a car process set up. We had a, a, a Mini Cooper um, surrounded um, all the way around, uh, sides, back, top, ceiling, with, um, with LED screens. And it showed very nicely um, it's really a, a nice way of explaining how uh, LED screens can be used for uh, background plates, uh, for lighting effects, for reflections on shiny surfaces. Um, it's really a nice way of showing what can be done on a, on a smaller scale. So Scott, if right. you're ready to roll. Sure, sure. Um, so what we're doing is we're doing lighting, reflections, and as we've gotten higher density panels to, for camera to actually look at, um, doing what I call green screen replacement. So I'm going to play this 
this piece um, right now. You know, if you look at films these days and you, you literally wonder if they were actually traveling or not, it's because of the advances that PRG and VER have been able to make, supporting filmmakers to achieve these shots. This enhanced lighting technique enables you to run the actual background plates on LED screens outside the windows and above, simultaneously light and composite driving shots. One of the immediate benefits of using a system like this is that the actors can look out the windows and know where they in my experience, actors love it. They walk on the stage and they're always surprised that they expect a green screen and then they see what's actually in front of camera. Like in my case, we shot a helicopter crash and at some point the helicopter started spinning and they just looked out the window and saw the world spinning. This actually has a big effect on budget because there's no green screen outside, there's no compositing, there's no uncertainty. These are finished shots. They could be inside a penthouse in Dubai. They could be a spaceship. They could be traveling towards the moon. It goes into the headspace of this company and, and they can come up with solutions for you. So it's, you don't have to be bound by what's been done before. You can look forward to something that hasn't been done. One Irishman is a recent example of car process work. Um, we cannot repeat the strong language that Al Pacino and Robert De Niro used when they, they walked onto the set and, and saw the setup, but um, this is this is what it looks like. So all of the uh, uh, car shots that were used uh, within the movie, uh, believe it or not, were done using a uh, LED environment. So um, the LED environments also made it uh, possible for the um, the special camera rig, which made it possible for the de aging and the aging. Uh, um, effect they, they, they use in the movie, but doing it in a very realistic way surrounding those cars uh, made it possible to, to basically film any way they, they, they wanted it. Um, a very nice example here uh, showing both lighting and uh, re reflections. This, this was um, a movie which we did, I don't know, five years ago or six years ago, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. This was one of the biggest volumes we built up until that point. Um, and it was made in such a way that the end caps um, at the end of the long part of the room can open up and then you can bring one train car out and pull a different one in. Um, we even built a little bit of a cove, as Jerome was talking about earlier, a curve. Even though the panels are flat, we can do something like that in case camera was up high, you know, looking down inside the, the train car. It's really one of the, the, it's the very beginning of using uh, the word LED volume uh, as a way to name these uh, large LED setups and canvases. Murder on the Orient Express was really a technical milestone in the evolution of enhanced environments, I dare say, both in, in scale, size, technology and complexity. And this is a very nice example uh, where the LED is more used as lighting because the, the, the train is actually going through a uh, icy, snowy uh, landscape. So the, the lighting reflects that, but also the reflections in the shiny surfaces all the way to the eyeballs of the, of the talent is, is, is very nicely achieved through this technique. And uh, from, from that point on, really, we, we were able to uh, diversify more products uh, used for this process. Uh, another nice example is uh, is actually uh, the movie First Man, which uh, Scott is going to share right now. For the Universal Pictures film First Man, we built a screen that was in the shape of a half cylinder. It was uh, 34 feet tall um, and about 60 feet in diameter. Um, that's 20 LED tiles high and uh, 57 wide. The camera crew came into our facility um, in LA. They shot the movie in Atlanta, but they came in to LA beforehand to shoot tests, which we always recommend. And they shot tests on 16 millimeter motion picture film, uh, 35 millimeter and IMAX as well. And then they end up using all three um, of those formats for the movie. Um, they also built uh, nearly full size models or partial models of various aircraft. And those aircrafts, uh, the aircraft were usually mounted onto a gimbal so they could simulate 
like heavy vibration or rotation. Um, Lena Sandgren was the DP who op also operated a camera. Paul Lambert, the visual effects supervisor said that the reflections they got for free, but that's really the main selling point about this. Um, there's no compositing needed in post. DNEG created all the background plates and of course all the plates had to be built before production. Uh, much like the film Gravity, which we also use this technology for, the actors can react to the environment um, since they're not looking at a green screen or from a ball hanging from a string. The directors can see what the final shot looks like. There are quite a few sequences in this film that um, where LED screens were used. Um, the, the DP's idea was, idea was um, no green screen, although I think they might have actually used green screen for um, were part of it. And uh, reflection is really what enhances the, uh, the filmmaker's process. Uh, to stay a little bit in the, in the trade team today, the train team, I should say, today, uh, I'd like to talk about another recent uh, project. And, it, and it's not an obvious one because few people realize that the train sequence in, in, in the movie Joker was actually done uh, inside an enhanced environment. Um, and uh, next to talk about this is, uh, is the actual DP from the movie, L Lauren Schur. Larry Schur, ASC. Here we go. A big part of what I try to accomplish, besides coming up with a very specific game plan visually, is how do you give the most freedom to the actors and allow the set to move as quickly as possible to keep the momentum of the day. And I've found that if something's working, keep those actors close, don't let them go to their trailers and just keep shooting while everybody's in the right state of mind. And what's really great about enhanced environments and the way that the LED technology has allowed you to make these environments live on set, you realize what effect it has on the actors and what effect it has even on the filmmaker like myself as a cinematographer, because suddenly you're not trying to coordinate that background later with the lighting that you're putting in but you're actually able to photograph it in real time and make decisions and bring the lighting in real time as you photograph it in ways that necessarily you can't do when you're shooting blue screen or green screen. You know, one way we did that on Joker is in the subway sequence. And Todd always talked about that as having almost like a fever dream. That was the way he talked about it. It's like, I want this scene to feel like a fever dream. And for me, what's cool about riding subways in New York is the way the lighting interacts with the environment and the fact that when you drive by a subway station or another train car passes by or the lights flicker off inside the car, all that interactive lighting is playing inside. The real problem to be solved in that scene was, well, how do we get all that interactivity but do it in a controlled environment in which we can be shooting on a stage, not have all the distractions of being on location, but really make it feel real for the actors. Once I was like, the only way we can do this Joker subway scene is with LEDs, I just called up PRG and said, let's figure out a solution to this. I wanted the control of all these elements that you pass by when you're in the subway station. And this, without question, we could never do even if we decided to do it real in a subway, which is I wanted the ability not just to flicker lights off and on, which we could have done if we shot it real, but I wanted to make decisions as to when another train car passed us by, when we passed by a subway station, when a section of fluorescent lights went by. And suddenly now we could be inside the subway car, which for the actors and for Todd Phillips and our operator was a living, breathing, moving vehicle for all intents and purposes. And with a push of the button, have a subway car pass by outside. And so that level of control and the way we could put that into the scene, because I don't think people really realize it's been done with an enhanced environment. And that to me is its greatest success. Yes, and then I would like to just uh, uh, finish this presentation with uh, how we work together with, uh, with, with these DPs and people that develop the script. But basically what we try to do is um, trying to find the storyboard, trying to find the shot planning, uh, through the breakdown of the script and really work together very closely um, with the DPs to find uh, the right solution and the right sizes. And it, it doesn't have to be a massive uh, Mandalorian uh, LED uh, volume. It can, can be downscaled all the way down to uh, smaller setups. And, and that brings me to, uh, to the end of our presentation. Thank you, uh, Scott and Carl. 
Thank you, Scott. You know, thank you very much. Uh, quickly, we have some time here for, for q and I'm not sure if any questions came in. Um, Aaron, uh, any questions for the panel? Hey, guys. Um, I had a few come in privately on chat that I'm going to ask. Um, one of them was about XR content, your own. Does XR content take longer to create than other kinds of content? XR content uh, doesn't necessarily take longer to create. It is a different process than creating normal content because you have to think of the environment you're going into and that environment has to be created uh, in, in, in 3D basically. Uh, and then the only added time, uh, if you would compare it with a normal process, is that uh, you have to bring it into a gaming engine in order to run on set. But that added time is completely saved uh, at the very end of the, of the shoot uh, in where once you go off set, uh, once you leave the set, once you leave the stage, uh, it's, it's it, that's it, you're done, you're finished, everything is done. Cool. Uh, there was another one about enhanced environment game engine technology. How can you bring content into enhanced environment without using the game engine? Um, when you're not using a, a gaming engine, it means uh, you're uh, narrowing down the controls you have on set. You're basically just background uh, playing. The controls you have there with background, is that means that the background playing you are uh, playing uh, is, uh, can be controlled in terms of speed, intensity, uh, you can control your colors, but obviously you cannot change within that content because it's just a shot plate, it's a finished plate. So that's the big difference. Okay, I, I have another question that came in from Michael Capolini. Capoli? Uh, Michael wants to know more about the setup they've created for Chicago shows. Yeah, um, I can I can answer any specific questions, but um, we're we're basically inside a a new studio. It's called Cine City, um, which is right next door to Cine Space. So we have all those between our um, kind of camera hub, Camera Chicago, uh, on Western Avenue and Cine Space, and our facility in McCook. We have pretty much a, a full circle, 360 degree production support team. So um, down down the road, there's going to be a rooftop pool at our location. There'll be a hotel and rooms available for short-term and long-term stay. Um, there's going to be a bar and restaurant kind of on the first floor. There's there's a few other production uh, companies that are that are moving in right now. Um, in the basement, there's going to be a film composing studio. Um, so really. Uh, PRG is just kind of embracing the the boom in production that's happening in Chicago and, and trying to support that full 360. Does that answer your question? Um, I think, could we bring Michael in to make sure his question got answered? Or, uh, is that possible? Yep, give me one minute. Great. I can talk a little bit more about um, enhanced environments and LED. Um, during these times, we are getting we are so busy in getting so many um, queries for, for LED volumes. Um, and I'll give you a for instance, on the, on the Dick Wolf Chicago shows, um, the DPs were, were already asking me for this. And um, I, was, I was sort of pushing, why don't we get a, do a car set up and have it on a stage and all three of you shows share it for the season. But the productions were like, no, 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 we've got our own separate budgets. We really can't share anything. But now, in the time we're at now, they're, they're coming back to us and asking us about it because um, they can't, they're being told they can't be out and about shooting as much anymore. Um, they've got to be on stage as much as possible. So, so bringing these environments onto stage where they've got control and they've got their crew um, all quarantined in there while they're shooting um, is going to be a big advantage. We're also quoting out what I call translight replacements, where normally you'd have a painted backing or, um, or a photograph outside of a set window and from an interior set. Um, 
now um, we're talking about putting LED out there. So um, changing the time of day or weather, as long as you've got the plate already shot, is just, of course, the push of a button. So I see Michael has Michael joined us. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Can you, can you all hear me? Do you want to, uh, did we touch on that, on, on your message question? Or yes. Did you yeah, thank you very much. I, I just was, I was curious. I work on, on uh, Chicago PD and I was curious if, uh, you know, what the new, if there were new developments. Scott, you kind of answered some of my question. Thank you. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure you'll be doing it or not. Um, I, we haven't formally quoted it. We've just been throwing the idea around a bit, but. Okay. Um, and Michael, yeah. we can always, you know, if, if you want to talk offline or get an email going, we can always, we can always uh, discuss it a little more. Thank you for your question then. No problem. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, Aaron. Any others? Um, yeah, there's another one here. Is there a level of workflow retraining required to leverage enhanced environments and virtual productions? You know, and you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, I think going forward, um, is uh, there's going to be plenty of gear available. Everybody will have cameras and LED and media servers and you know, the whole lot. But what we're seeing already, because um, it, it does require uh, a highly uh, skilled level of, uh, of, of, especially on the operator controlling side of things, um, there's just going to be a shortage of, of people. We, we, not only we, but uh, the industry has to, has to start thinking about uh, creating a bench of people uh, cre all the way down to the film schools uh, and where we train uh, people in, in this new way of, of filmmaking. Um, it, it has become, if, if it wasn't already, but it definitely has become a very, very uh, high level of um, technological uh, experience all the way from the IT part, uh, people working in, 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 in networking, making sure all the screens get, get the right content, but also, uh, like I said earlier, on the, on the media server side of things, especially for the more complex setups, but all the way down also to, uh, to previous and, and creating the actual content. It has become way more complex because the more flexibility you want to have on set, uh, the more it has to be brought in on the front end uh, to, to deal with that. And then, the next limitation will be actually uh, computer uh, power, because that's going to be the next limitation next to uh, people. That's great. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for you too, your own. Um, you've said in some interviews that you believe Hollywood filmmaking will become increasingly more virtual in a post-corona world. Can you tell me about that prediction and how enhanced environments plays into it? Yeah, enhanced environments or, or just virtual produ production in, in general um, uh, allows for uh, less people on set, allows for remote working. So combine that with the uh, restrictions we're currently operating under with, with COVID-19, it's, it's n nothing more than, than logical going forward that virtual production will become and will play more a dominant role into the whole filmmaking process uh, because first of all we can continue making beautiful content uh, but also uh, we have to we have to do it in a different way we have to do it remotely we have to do it with less people on set and we have to do it more spread apart so uh, one and one in in this case is <laughs> is really two <laughs> Thank you. Aaron, uh, anything else? Yeah. No, that was um, all I had from my end. Okay, good, guys. Well, we're getting up against it. So I think we, uh, anything else quickly, Logan, Scott, any, any panel want to add to, uh, to the discussion before we wrap it up? I, I see was... Colin Lindgren on the chat channel reaching out to us. He is the programmer board up on Chicago PD and uh, excited to work with us with uh, the LED process. And he, apparently this is the first time he, uh, he heard about it. So Colin, can you uh, expand a little bit on your, uh, on your question? Hi, uh, I guess I don't really have a question. I was just uh, excited to hear about it. I guess if I do have a question, um, in 
in what you usually send out for media server equipment in this scenario? I've seen um, Catalyst and I've seen Resolume. Are there other servers that you guys use? Absolutely. Uh, there's also Hypothizer. That is uh, Kais, formerly known as uh, D3. And then there is also a, a PRG VR proprietary product called Mbox. So with the ones with Resolumen you just said and uh, um, uh, Catalyst, although Catalyst is being used less and less, I think you, you have the, uh, uh, not all of them, but at least the, the most used of them. Cool, awesome. Um, we do have one more question. We have about three minutes to get through it. Um, Ian Scott asked, as an LED tech in Atlanta, are you seeing more studios asking for multi-LED car process or enhanced setups? We can start with that. Before COVID, I would like to see some studios rent LED for a matter of weeks and use it for production, but also move it around the studios from week to week. As things are more contained and restricted, do you think it's better to have more of these setups set in with studios during these current conditions? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we see a, a, a lot of those questions in where, where studios indeed are uh, uh, asking for us to do a, a, a semi-permanent setup. Uh, the unfortunate thing is with these uh, LED environments is that there is no one size, one solution that fits all. It's just impossible. Uh, there are, every DP will ask for a different angle, a different camera, uh, and that will translate itself into having to provide different pixel pitches like I discussed on the on the presentation, uh, different size, a curve, non-curve, ceiling, no ceiling. So the only thing that would make it more uh, efficient, so to say, is when you have the gear actually at your uh, disposal inside the studio. So you avoid doing big load-ins and big transport. So that's, that, that is something we do see with the, uh, with the studios is that they are becoming increasingly interested to have uh, direct access uh, to, to gear and, and inventory. You know, and I'll, I'll add to that, and then, um, and then Aaron will go ahead and wrap it up. But uh, to your point, now, because this technology is, so, is going to be so prevalent uh, post-COVID, um, to, to the own's point, uh, it's not a plug-and-play system. And so it's always been challenging to have uh, just a dedicated set up for productions to roll in and out. But now because of the volume we're experiencing and because of the, 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 the need for uh, 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 virtual sets, I think now we're going to, as an organization, PRG, now we're gonna have a lot of opportunities coming up in the next six months or so to have these, what I, what I would refer to as semi-permanent installations where the volume of work and the types of productions um, I mean, if everybody uh, in uh, just to, you know, throw in, if everybody that goes through Pinewood is no one's using a uh, trailer process anymore. And so in those instances, um, we might have an opportunity to keep it as near plug and play as possible. But traditionally on, on a larger scale projects, they're very, each one is very unique other than the fact that there's a server and LED, everything else beyond that is, um, is, is a la carte. So good question. And that's something that, that we, um, that is a challenge for us too, but I, I think you may we may see more uh, of of the uh, um, embeddedment, if that's a word, inside uh, inside the studios. So, um, good question. As I said, anything, Aaron? I'm going to wrap it up unless we have anything. Uh, okay, um, I'd like to thank the panelists and the audience, um, and of course, a huge big thank you uh, to Filmscape. Um, thank you for collaborating with us, and uh, we certainly hope that next year. Uh, we can all do this in person, uh, but this has been great. Uh, so if anybody, um, any of our attendees have any uh, questions uh, on any of the technology that you heard about today or our safety protocols uh, or um, our new facility in Chicago, uh, you can go to PRG's exhibitor page or of course, uh, PRG.com. And then we also encourage everyone to stay in the loop on our socials. Uh, we have constant updates uh, with new technologies um, and all, all, kinds of, all kinds of fun things. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you all. Uh, stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see and talk to all of you soon.